this is uh, Pamela Tanner Ball, and we're here today to uh, catch up with some of the uh, folks who are in our film, To Which We Belong, which came out in 2021. And the Savory Institute is a really important uh, part of the film. And we are uh, here with Bobby Gill, who is a very important guy over at Savory. He tells the world about what they're doing there. And so, uh, Bobby, for first of all, uh, tell us briefly, um, for people who may not know, what is the scope of Savory? What, how many acres do you impact? What is the impact? And uh, just kind of give us the overview of your organization. How many hubs, countries? Yeah. Awesome. Well, great to be here. Nice to see you again, Pamela. It's been a few years since we've been able to get together in person. So, you know, I'll take a Zoom call any day. Um, <laughs> But just very briefly, Savory Institute, we're a nonprofit. We're based in Boulder, Colorado, but we work all across the globe. And our mission is to regenerate global grasslands. We do that through the intentional and holistic management of livestock on grazing lands. So we teach farmers and ranchers and pastoralists how to manage their herds of livestock in a way that rather than degrading the landscape, which is what a lot of animal agriculture does, we teach them to do it in a way that actually regenerates ecosystem function. And that's been demonstrated to be effective across all six inhabitable continents. Um, the way we do this is we have a global network of educational learning sites or what we call savory hubs. Um, we have just over 50 savory hubs to date. Um, the network has been around for about a decade now. We started it in 2013. So just over a decade of the savory network um, and in that time, uh, we haven't collected data from 2023 yet. That's something we'll be doing here in the next month or so. So we'll have some updated metrics in about a month, I'd say. Um, but as of last year's data, we've influenced a little over 75 million acres globally. Uh, I think that'll that's 29 million hectares, if you want to convert it into hectares. And we've trained over 22,000 people through the network. Um, so, you know, that's just, uh, it's us trying to get out there, work with the land managers and give some love to the grasslands, recognizing how critically they, it, critically important they are. You know, they represent 5 billion hectares across the globe. And some estimates say that up to 70% of grasslands are degraded due to mismanagement. So, you know, we're on a mission to fix that. So Bobby, tell us in a few short sentences or, you know, as short as you can, uh, for people who don't know, what is the difference between the kind of grazing and the management that Savory is in in instituting on the grasslands? And why does it, what does it do that's that's good for mm -hmm. people, it, animals, et cetera? So is the question, how does it differ from, you know, traditional livestock management schemes that most folks are doing? Sure. Um, well, a lot of livestock agriculture, animal animal agriculture out there is what we call set stock grazing or continuous grazing operations. It's most often putting the animals out to pasture, leaving there, leaving them there for the entire season, and then rounding them up at the end of the season coming to get them. The problem with that, although it's nice to have this hands-off approach and it doesn't require a lot of management um, in terms of labor hours, the problem being if animals have free access to the entire pasture, what they're going to do is they're going to continually regraze the more palatable grasses and forages, and they're going to neglect the, the less palatable forage. And so what ends up happening is they end up overgrazing certain species and certain plants, and then they also undergraze certain plants. And there's it's kind of a U-shaped curve in terms of the ideal amount of grazing that a plant needs. You don't want to graze it too much. You don't want to overgraze it, but you also don't want to undergraze it. There's a certain amount of stimulation that happens from the bite of the cow or the goat or the sheep or the bison that's necessary for that plant to maintain vigor. And when that plant maintains vigor, it's able to capture CO2 from the atmosphere, turn it into, um, you know, store it into um, long chain carbohydrates down in the soil, which improves soil fertility. All of that helps improve water holding capacity and biodiversity, wildlife habitat, all these sorts of things. Um, but to do so, there's this sweet spot of getting just the right amount of grazing, the right amount of animal impact on the land, and then having an appropriately timed rest period. So 
Whereas most folks go out there and they just leave their animals to pasture and they overgraze the land and the land dies off and it just becomes bare ground. What we do is we mimic the natural migratory herds that grazing herbivores have always had on large grassland ecosystems. So in the U.S., if you imagine herds of bison, there used to be 75 million bison roaming across the U.S., well, we don't have that anymore, but we can mimic those tightly bunched herds through the use of herding or using things like portable electric fencing and then planning the movements of those herds across a farm or a ranch, um, you know, using some calculations on what are the, the grass uh, rest re and recovery periods that are needed, how much animal impact do you need based on how much forage you have. And essentially we mimic that grazing pattern across a landscape just in this modern context. That's great. And is it fair to say that when you're raising the animals in this managed way, bunched and keeping them moving across the uh, lands, that the lands are actually can end up holding more water? They have more water holding capacity? Because yeah, yeah, absolutely. There's, um, I think research shows that when you increase soil organic matter by 1%, that allows an acre of land to hold anywhere between 20,000 to 27,000 additional gallons of water. Um, that number is going to be dependent on the bulk density of the soil, so the specific properties of that soil. But generally, if you're able to improve the organic matter, the fertility of that soil, you get better soil health. Essentially, what you're doing is you're activating the soil to be a sponge so that it can then absorb and hold more water. And that's beneficial, one, because you have more water uh, for times when you need it, like drought, which is the case for many places all over the globe. Um, but that water also uh, can be protective uh, at other times. You know, say you get a heavy rainfall event, you get multiple inches of rain in an hour or in a short period of time. If that soil carbon sponge is able to absorb the water more quickly, you're less likely to have a flooding event, which leads to erosion and runoff and all the downstream effects from there. That's so great. Thank you. And the, obvi the other obvious benefit from my point of view is if you can get the soil to uh, through planting, uh, having more diverse plants on the on the land, because the cattle aren't just munching the things that they like down to the nub, you have the you have the ability to draw down more CO two from the atmosphere, mm -hmm. and in a way store it in the soil. Yeah, so various research points to the carbon sequestration potential of holistically managed grasslands, uh, those that are actively regenerating. And, you know, it's going to depend on the specific conditions of that specific landscape. But usually research points to anywhere between two to seven tons of carbon per hectare per year is what can be, um, you know, drawn out of the atmosphere and then stored in the soil uh, through properly managed grazing. So my understanding is we have about I between 3.5 billion and 5. Point billion hectares of grasslands around mm -hmm. the world. Yeah. So, whoa, you're doing how many now? 30, 30,000 so, hectares. If you compare, well, yeah, no, I think done. I got that wrong. <laughs> no, 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 you did, you did get it right. There's, uh, you know, roughly 5 billion hectares of grasslands across the globe. It depends on if you're, you know, classifying Arctic tundra as grassland and, you know, deserts, you know, there's certain contextual definitions and, you know, people can argue what the exact amount is, but it's a large amount. It's roughly one third of the earth's terrestrial land mass. That's roughly what we're dealing with here. So that's a significant portion of our land, you know, a third of it. Uh, about a third of it is forested, about a third of it is grassland, and about a third of the globe is is ice. That's pretty much, you know, kind of how you can break things down. Um, we're trying to influence as much of that as possible. Uh, you know, to date, we've influenced, you know, if we're talking in hectares now, that's more of the international standard for, for land measurement. We've influenced around 29 million. So 29 million compared to 5 billion, there's a significant difference. We've got a ways to go. Wow. But, you know, we're talking one third of the earth. So, uh, you know, for a small nonprofit, you know, we're 14 people. Uh, uh, I think we're doing rather well for ourselves in terms of the impact we've been able to create globally thus far. Oh, you're doing great. Uh, but isn't there a plan uh, to work with uh, the 
I, th I think it's called the Savory Foundation, which is a new thing out of Denmark. Yeah. So that you can get funding <clears throat> to work on larger parcels of land. Isn't that a new thing yeah. in your organization? Yeah. So part of Savory's strategy isn't just to educate and equip land managers. Another piece of it is to remove barriers that are in the way for those producers um, so as to make adoption easier for folks. One of the ways we've done that is our land to market program that's working with brands so that they can have uh, you know, raw materials that come from verified regenerating landscapes and, and getting those into supply chains so that you can you know, vote with your dollar Developing that marketplace for regenerative products is one thing that we've done. And, you know, just to show you, I brought a little prop. Here's just milk that I got from the store. And you can see the land to market verified logo. And they say, you know, it's land to market verified. It's good for biodiversity, clean water, carbon storage, soil health, all that good stuff. So that's Savers program. Look for this seal. That's how you know that your product is regenerative. So that's one way we remove barriers for producers. The second way, which you were getting at, is the new Savory Foundation, which we just founded in 2022, based in Denmark. And the barrier we're trying to remove there is finance. Um, so financial flows right now are quite difficult for producers. It's hard for people to get access to land. It's hard for them to get paid for the true value of the ecosystem services that they're providing. You know, they're not just providing, you know, good, high quality milk or, and meat uh, or leather or wool to people. They're also sequestering carbon. They're also improving wildlife habitat. They're also improving water holding capacity. They're creating climate resilience. You know, they're creating, um, you know, circular economies that support, you know, rural economics. All these sorts of things are incredibly valuable. So we've started a new foundation in Denmark, and the goal of this foundation is to attract large-scale funding uh, large institutional funding um, so that we can push that towards some large-scale grassland regeneration projects. I mentioned we have about 50 hubs around the world, but we're not everywhere. You know, there's places like Mongolia where there are substantial amounts of grass. Mongolia is all grassland, um, but we don't have any savory hubs there. And it's, it's hard to get into certain places uh, for various reasons, uh, but we can strategically locate ourselves there through uh, pilot projects and special projects that we can do if the right funding is to land there. So that's what the that's what the foundation has been developed to do um, to basically get this institutional funding where you have governments, they have huge amounts of funding that is just sitting there wanting to help the people, wanting to find ways to support climate smart nature-based solutions, uh, you know, to some of these global issues that we're facing and they want to land it, but it needs to be really large scale to do so. And so that's what we're doing with the foundation in Denmark. Um, there is a second piece of that where we're also looking in these projects that we're doing through the foundation to see if we can revolutionize the ecosystem service markets. So there's a lot of discussion on carbon trading and carbon markets, and it's all voluntary at this point. It's still in its infancy. But the reality is, is that farmers get just a small, small fraction of what goes into these carbon credits. Um, it's not really just for the farmers and the communities for whom are doing all the work. So what we're looking to do with these pilot projects is see if we can come up with a new model that puts real value on ecosystem service, not just on the carbon, because on the carbon, because that's just one piece of the puzzle. We're also looking to see, can we value the carbon sequestration aspect of grasslands? Can we also value the biodiversity and wildlife habitat? Can we value the water? Can we take a more holistic assessment at the true value that these farmers and ranchers are providing to the landscape and figure out how that is monetized. What is the value of that? And ensuring that this model goes back so that as much as possible goes back to the farmers and their communities and not just pulled out by the middlemen, which is the case of most carbon trading schemes. So we're looking to to, to try out some, some new models um, in terms of ecosystem service markets. It's still the early days, um, but we are convinced that if we are going to really accelerate adoption of this, there's something that has to change in terms of the financial incentives for producers. And so this is our attempt at uh, figuring out the right way to do it there in a more holistic manner. And also not only a more holistic manner, but also on a larger scale. Didn't I read somewhere on your site, I believe there was a something about 504 
Yeah, the, oh man, what is the goal that we have set out for the Savory Foundation? So here you're, you're catching me um, on my heels because I run the communications for Savory Institute, but Savory Foundation, obviously sister entity, it's a different legal structure. Um, but yeah, I think the goal of the Savory Foundation is to, uh, to influence 500,000 hectares uh, through their projects. So, you know, it's going after a significant amount. So essentially they're going after half a billion hectares. So whereas we've done 29 million hectares so far, through the Savory Institute, we're hoping to really take that up to 500 uh, million through the um, through the foundation through these large scale projects. So, what am I excited about for the future? And I guess I can perceive that in terms of both excited about for Savory, or what am I excited about just generally speaking um, in the world of regenerative agriculture. I I think the the biggest thing is just the momentum behind the regenerative agriculture movement. Um, you know, to which we belong came out at this critical point where we were starting to see an uptick in interest in regenerative agriculture. And that's just grown and grown and grown um, as the years have gone on. There is just so much activity and interest, uh, not just here in the U.S., but globally. I mean, you saw in the film, uh, the Mara Training Center at Inon Kishu Conservancy, you know, that's the savory hub in Kenya. Um, you know, there's so many new savory hubs that have come on board. There's people from all different walks of life who are learning about what we're doing at savory and what they can and how they can be taking that to their local land management community. Um, and they're doing it. And so it's just exciting to see all these different people from all walks of life, um, you know, coming into holistic management and the savory network and, you know, putting their own spin on it and, you know, finding new ways to, to bring this um, opportunity to, to new audiences. So it's really incredible to see. Um, there's also, you know, it's now easier than ever to align your purchasing behavior with regenerative agriculture. You know, I showed the, the land to market seal that you can find, um, you know, at the store, you know, you can go to any grocery store and buy steaks, jerky, milk, yogurt, butter, all these sorts of things. You can buy leather boots, you can buy wool scarves. There's, uh, you know, all sorts of things that you can find out there. So, you know, I encourage people to go to landtomarket.com. You can see all the different brands. You can see different buying guides um, to see what kinds of products that uh, you know you might be buying on a day-to-day -day basis and how you can kind of incrementally move towards supporting regenerative agriculture through your purchasing power. That's a really, really important thing to do because that really sends the signals to the markets and to the farmers that this is what you want. And by doing that, Farmers are going to change their practices and they're going to move more towards regenerative if they know that that's what consumers are asking for. It's better for their land. And if there's a market there, it's better for their wallet. So vote with your dollar in favor of land market, regenerative agriculture. That's incredible. Um, aside from that, you know, I'd say if people want to get involved, uh, if you own land or livestock, you know, see how you might be able to change your practices, see if what you're doing um, is as good as possible for the land. Um, Savory, we have a land monitoring protocol where you can um, measure ecosystem function on your landscape. Uh, the protocol is called Ecological Outcome Verification, or EOV, and that's a program that farmers and ranchers uh, can get involved with. Essentially, uh, someone comes out, uh, an EOV monitor, and they, they do some baseline measurements. We're looking at both above ground and below ground indicators of ecosystem function, and you get a report that tells you, you know, how your land is doing, and you do that every year so that you know, am I trending in the right direction, or am I maybe not doing as good as I thought I was. Super important to have those feedback loops for producers. Um, and then the last thing, if people want to get involved, you know, Savory Institute, we're a nonprofit. So um, if you want to support us uh, financially, uh, we would greatly appreciate any contributions. If you go to savory.global um, and click on the donate button, um, that'll give you a variety of different options. Uh, we have, uh, you know, folks that give, $20 a month, $50 a month. These are our regenerating members. And there's all sorts of great perks that you get in exchange uh, for your monthly support. So, um, you know, you can come join the 700 other regenerating members that we already have supporting Savory a um, little bit uh, every month, but it really goes a long way. So um, 
you know, I think that's it for updates from the Savory Institute. Thanks. And just again, wanted to echo my thanks to, to Pamela and the team at To Which We Belong. Uh, this film has just been such a, a critical piece of media to really sharing the story of regenerative agriculture and what's possible and doing it in a really authentic um, way that really takes the, a global lens. And so I know I recommend the film to everyone I meet. It's by far my favorite regenerative ag documentary out there. So thanks again for including us in the film and uh, can't wait to see what you come up with next.